this looks great. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, Vineeth Bol, I'm really sorry for your <laughs> the pronunciation. Vineeth Bolasubramanian is an You're associate professor <laughs> in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the Indian Institute of Technology in Hyderabad, India. His research focuses on the intersection of theory and applications of machine learning, specifically including topics such as explainable and robust models, multimodal vision language models, and organic lifelong learning, which we'll hear about today. He has many foundational works in lifelong learning, and we're happy to have him here today. So without further ado, uh, Vineet, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Tyler, for the uh, introduction and the kind invitation to be a part of this event. I think it's uh, uh, looks to be a wonderful event, and I'm glad to be talking about our research uh, at the event. Uh, so just one logistic question before we move forward. So am I correct that the Q&A is all towards the end? There are no questions in between. Is that right? Yeah, if that's okay with you, we've been taking questions absolutely. at the end. Sure, sure. Absolutely. Okay. I'll awesome. just plan. Great. Okay. So uh, as uh, you see on the slide, my topic is going beyond continual learning towards organic uh, lifelong learning. And I'll hopefully try to uh, demystify that as uh, we go forward. So the TLDR, I think the attention span of everybody is dropped these days. So I think I thought I'll start with my talk with the TLDR at the beginning rather than the end uh, to say what this talk is about. So uh, we all know that learning continually is on newer tasks, classes, domains has gained importance uh, across different uh, applications in recent years. Uh, the question that I'd like to perhaps add to the conversation is do existing settings really capture the real world? Or how can we make continual learning or lifelong learning more organic, right? So hopefully I'll try to clarify that over the rest of this talk and I'll be happy to also uh, have some discussions around it towards the end. So um, I think we all know that the success of machine learning over the last decade has been in supervised learning, be it images, be it text, be it speech. Uh, the success has been in uh, generating large amounts of curated uh, data curated annotated data and you then learn from them. That's where the success has been. Uh, and uh, I'll be very quick with this. I do know that uh, everybody has been speaking about continual learning. So the focus of late has been to go towards static supervised learning in several different ways, right? So, and there are many applications in self-driving vehicles, robotics, medical applications, conversational agents, so on and so forth. And continual learning gives us one grip on how we can go beyond IID or your standard supervised learning setting, where we have largely tried to adapt from a more human way of learning things where we learn continually over time, rather than be uh, defined to one particular static supervised model, right? So all of this is something that I'm quite sure you've been hearing about from every speaker so far. So let me try to now uh, start here from trying to draw a parallel between supervised learning and say how humans go about learning in a more organic fashion. So in standard supervised learning, you have your stand, you have your training data that comes from a distribution, say D1. Then you have a learner using which you learn a model, and then you deploy it on a test distribution. Right. So, so that's your standard uh, supervised learning where you typically learn from a fixed data set for, with a fixed fixed set of labels. But then if you try to just broaden your view and try to observe how humans learn, we obviously learn from available data which may or may not have labels, right? So you could do that. We also learn from refining using newer data without forgetting the past significantly. We can also learn only from descriptions without access to data. For example, if somebody told me a zebra is like a horse with stripes, I probably roughly know what a zebra looks like, even if I never had seen a zebra. Uh, or I could learn interactively by asking questions like how we do in these kinds of events where we ask pointed questions to refine our understanding and learn from that process. Or we also have the ability to say, I don't know and ask for more information to learn a new concept. And all of this together defines how humans go about learning. We cannot really say that one of this is more than the other, maybe for different humans it is, but in general, we learn from any of these mechanisms. This is not even an exhaustive list. We learn from any of these mechanisms uh, as we encounter data in daily life. And is this all new, new to machine learning? Not really. I'm quite sure all of you know these settings. Uh, you could have 
continual learning defined where a human uh, learns by refining using newer data without forgetting the past. You have zero shot learning where you learn only from descriptions without access to data. Or you have active learning where you learn interactively by asking questions. Or you have open set or open world learning where you can uh, integrate the ability to say, I don't know, and perhaps ask for more information to learn a new concept, right? So you could do all of this. So if one had to see what's the equivalence in terms of learning models, we have these days several settings defined in different ways. Let's go over a few of them. So your standard supervised learning is what we spoke about earlier. So if you, uh, a natural follow-up of that is multitask learning where you have different tasks where XY comes from a distribution D1, for task two, XY comes from a distribution D2, so on and so forth till DN. And you typically train a single learner that now tries to predict a new X on any of these distributions. So which means you could now assume that you have a, a face image and you want to predict the gender, expression, pose, so on and so forth, right? The identity of the person, so on and so forth. That could be an example of multitask learning. Then we have transfer learning where we have a source domain, a target domain, where we want to transfer knowledge from the model learned on the source domain. Then we have domain adaptation where we directly try to leverage the data from the source domain. Then we have K-shot learning where you have up to N classes, where up to M less than N classes, you have all of your data, all of your labeled data, but for the remaining M plus one to N classes, you could have only K samples. K could be zero, then we call it zero-shot learning. K could be a few, then we call it few short learning. Then we obviously have continual learning where we learn uh, distributions that change over time. But our goal is to, at test time, be able to predict data belonging to any of the distributions so far, assuming the label distribution changes over time in the class incremental setting. Or you have domain generalization where you learn from a couple of domains, TS and TT at training time. And at test time, you have to infer on a completely new domain, which is DT plus one, right? A new distribution altogether. So these are all different settings. I'm quite sure uh, most of you here know about also. Right? But the point that I wanted to allude to in this talk is perhaps what, how do we go beyond treating these as siloed settings, right? So far, the way we have developed machine learning algorithms is to say that, okay, for few short learning, this is what we're going to do. For zero shot learning, this is what we're going to do. For continual learning, this is what we're going to do, right? For domain adaptation, this is what we're going to do. But in the real world, data may not really tell us which setting it's going to adhere to on a given day, right? If you're dealing with um, data in the most organic form in any given application, you have data coming in over time. So which means you definitely want to do continual learning. You don't want to uh, refrain from that at all. You definitely want to keep learning continually. But then even within continual learning, we assume that we, if we say class incremental learning, we assume that we have a certain set of classes that come today. And we assume that there are a certain set of classes that come tomorrow or a month later or a year later, right? And then that's the setting we work with. Or we say that we work with domain incremental learning where the domain changes over time. And we'd like to build a model that can predict in any of these domains over time without forgetting the past domain. The more organic way of doing this is to say that you could just encounter any data at any point on any day, right? So today, it could be a certain task where you have a predefined set of classes. Tomorrow, you may end up having a task, which is a few short task. Day after, it could be a task which is zero shot. Day day after, it could be a long tail task. And the day after that, it could be an open set or open world task. And we still want to learn. And that's the way humans do it. Right? So we are capable of handling whatever comes at any point in time. So the broader question I probably wanted to bring to this conversation is, how do you kind of break these boundaries between settings and look at these settings in a more organic manner and continue to learn uh, purely contingent on what kind of data comes in at a particular given point in time, right? So that's the conversation that I wanted to bring in for uh, this session here. So how do we more be more organic in these settings is what I wanted to talk about. Uh, before I talk further on what we have done in this space, an obvious question that comes up these days is we live in the age of foundation models. Do you really need to talk about these kind of things? Can't I use uh, a SAM or one of these, a clip or a foundation model and be able to ad adapt or, ad or be able to even predict 
any of a zero shot class that comes in over time? Do we really need to learn continually? Do we really need to worry about a zero shot task coming tomorrow or a few shot tasks coming later? Uh, is perhaps something that I thought is worth talking a little bit about. So firstly, we all know that foundation models are trained on static data, which means they are trained on particular timestamp data. So I think the latest uh, chat GPT is until September of, uh, I know that the previous one was until September of 2021. I don't recall uh, what's the latest chat GPT trained on, but the foundation models are trained on static data which means adaptation to evolving data and evolving settings still is a challenge. It's not something that we know to address using foundation models effectively, at least. Uh, a more deeper question, which I thought was interesting, is we still don't know how much foundation models forget. Right? We haven't actually seen too many versions of foundation models. To go back and study to see which, what classes did chat GPT or any of the other foundation models uh, forget when compared to an earlier version of chat GPT, right? So that's something that has not been studied yet properly. So we still don't know whether foundation models can forget and to what extent the for forget, assuming you kept training them on newer and newer data sets, static data sets. I think the broader conversation around domain specific fine tuning, that is you want to uh, apply your models to specialized tasks I think still becomes important. I'll talk about one of these a little later in uh, in the talk today. Resource efficiency, right? So I've uh, at least had this uh, question that comes up from uh, large companies in particular. When you talk to them about continual learning, uh, one of the questions is, do we need it at all? I'm just going to retrain everything from scratch every month, right? So uh, it becomes somewhat easy to do when you have large amounts of compute resources, but it's not always an option for everybody in, in, in the field. So resource efficiency is another reason why continual learning becomes important. Uh, you cannot always retrain from scratch. Personalization and user context, that right? you want to be able to personalize your model, maybe to a group of users that you are adapting it to over time and giving a particular user context to the model could be another setting where uh, foundation models may not be able to do well and you still need to learn organically uh, in a continual manner. Also, uh, a slightly different take on this could also be the bias and fairness issues. Even social norms, values, and ethical issues could evolve over time. What was considered ethical today may not really have been ethical uh, 10 years ago or vice versa. So then how do you adapt to evolving social norms and values also could be a context for uh, learning in a lifelong manner. right? So there are many other issues that we can talk about here too. But maybe the broader uh, point that I wanted to convey is all of this is still relevant, even as uh, we build foundation models and use them on a daily basis. With that said, what I'll do over the rest of uh, the talk today, I'll try to keep a tab of time, is talk about a few of our efforts in the space of going towards organic lifelong learning. I'm not going to say that we have answered the questions uh, or answered the setting completely. But we have made some baby steps in this direction, and that's what I'll try to talk about. I'll uh, try to talk about three of our efforts, maybe talk about two of them in some detail and breeze through a, a third one. And I'll try to conclude perhaps with some open questions and challenges in the space and uh, happy to stay behind for discussions after that. So firstly, uh, as a, a group, uh, I work out of uh, IIT Hyderabad, an institution in India. So we have had several efforts in each of these directions, and maybe that's what prompted us to think this way, is we've had works in zero-shot and few-shot learning. We've been looking at active learning for a while. We have looked at data generation or feature-generative approaches to any of these settings. We've been looking at continual learning uh, for the last few years too, domain generalization, domain adaptation in, uh, in, in a few places. Uh, an obvious question then was, should all of these always be siloed? Because one thing when you notice when you work in all of these settings is that the methods seem to overlap a lot, right? So why should you consider one method in one place and not in the other place? Seems to be a natural question to ask. And perhaps that's what motivated us to ask this question as to why should we silo these settings, right? So why should you, sh you have a method only for few short learning uh, and not necessarily something that you can extend to continual learning, right? So that's where uh, our motivation came from. And since then, we have been trying to look at more uh, organic ways of merging these settings and bringing them together in meaningful ways. 
So one of our first efforts in this direction was open world object detection. Uh, to the best of our knowledge, this was perhaps the first work on uh, object detection in an open world setting. And this also was recognized uh, in India through an organization called NASCOM. Uh, it won an award there last year. And this is joint work with uh, Joseph, who's one, who's one of the organizers of the unconference here, and also Salman and Fahad from MBZ UAI at Abu Dhabi. And let me first uh, introduce the setting before I go into the, into the method itself. So the overall problem setting with open world uh, object detection in particular is you have your standard base supervised model that you train your model on. So you have a set of classes, uh, a set of known objects uh, based on which you train a base supervised model. But then over time, what could happen is you could encounter newer categories that are unknown, not necessarily that are known. And you ideally want to be able to classify them too. So some of these known could be among the known classes that you have. Some of them could be among and uh, sorry, uh, among some new known classes for which you could get labels as well as some unknown objects which may not be possible to label at a given point in time, right? So I'll also give you maybe a real world example of where this can occur once I finish describing our work here. So you could look at a setting like this where you have a set of known classes which you want to label uh, that becomes old known at this point in time. But some of these unknown samples that come in, you're able to label them using some oracles, use, a, use a human oracles that you have. But there are also some samples that you are not able to label at a given point in time. You ideally want to be able to classify or detect in this particular case any of these samples as you encounter them over time. Let me show you an example here. So initially, let's say you had an image such as this and you were doing object detection. Okay. You are able to detect, let's say the class person was part of your base task. You are able to detect the class person and draw a bounding box around it. But you're able to also draw a bounding box around other classes, such as uh, what you see here, these classes, but you don't know the labels of those classes at that point in time. But then over time, you're able to label some of those classes. So which means you update your model and you can now recognize apple and an orange and detect them. But your jalapeno continues to remain unknown because nobody was able to label that for you. Right. So you want to update your model to not only detect the person class without any examples of the person, okay, without generally the entire data set of the person class, but you want to be able to detect apple and orange as you go over time, but you still want to maintain the unknown as you go over time too, right? So the uh, challenging and interesting part of this is that in a later task, somebody else could be able to label jalapeno for you. And at that point in time, this unknown should become known as even though you may have a newer set of unknowns that arrive over time. But the interesting thing that I also wanted to point out here, which um, uh, I'll also show should be evident from our method is as you're able to uh, separate your knowns and unknowns better, classes that you did not detect earlier also get detected now, like the dining table here. Uh, you're able to discern even some of the other classes better when you separate the known and unknown classes. Okay, that's one of the observations that we had from our results. Let, but let me actually step in to our method itself. So this was this work was published a couple of years ago. Uh, so we had done it on top of faster CNNs at that point in time. But since then, there has been follow-up work on uh, building on top of transformers and using very similar ideas. But so the ideas should be very, very similar even on top of more contemporary architectures. But I'll talk about our work, which built it on top of faster CNNs. So as we know, faster RCNNs have a two-stage approach where you have a region proposal network, and then each of those proposals go through a later part of the architecture where you have a classification head and a regression head. So uh, we brought in three changes in this overall architecture to be able to implement open world object detection. And I'll talk about each of these in more detail. So the first one is to change the RPN into an unknown aware RPN. So the first thing we had to inform the region proposal network was to help it even include unknown objects as a potential proposal. Okay, and that was rather simple to do, in fact. Uh, the way we did it is 
you already have an objectness score that you get as part of your reason proposal network. So we simply sort order uh, all your reason proposals based on the objectness score. And then we now label those proposals which do not have an overlapping ground truth label. Right? So very simple. So uh, a particular reason proposal has a high objectness score, but then we now say that there's no overlapping ground truth for that particular uh, reason proposal. So which is most likely that it's going to be an unknown object because it has a high objectness score, right? So that's what we call as an unknown aware RPN. And that's how we change the training of the unknown aware RPN too, to for it to be able to include these unknown object proposals uh, in your subsequent parts of your pipeline. Yeah, the second aspect of uh, the contribution here was to introduce a contrastive clustering strategy. Uh, in this particular layer, we introduce a last layer of the ROI head of the faster RCNN architecture, which is able to separate the known classes and the unknown classes, right? So the main goal of this contrastive clustering strategy is to be able to uh, push all the unknowns to one particular region, because otherwise what could happen is the representations that you get in this part of the ROI could mix up your unknowns with some of the known classes, right? So it could just mix up with some of the unknown, uh, with some of the known classes, which means you'd not be able to classify an unknown as an unknown effectively, right? So that's why we introduce this contrastive clustering strategy where we try to push all the unknowns away from the clusters of the different known classes. And finally, we introduce an energy-based classification head where we show we leverage an earlier work at iClear 2020, which states that you could view any of your classification models as an energy-based model. So we simply view the logics of your classification head in terms of an energy-based model. And it's a very simple strategy, but we show that viewing it this way easily separates the knowns and the unknowns in terms of their energy values. Okay, so, and that becomes easy to separate the knowns and the unknowns from the classification head. And then within the knowns, we use the standard logits to be able to separate the class labels that you want to get out of your uh, object detector. Okay, so those are the three different contributions that we make within the system. Uh, how do you measure the performance of such an open world object detection system? Uh, we use two metrics, wilderness impact, which is nothing but uh, the, the number of known detections versus the number of known and unknown detections. That's what we refer as a uh, wilderness impact. We ideally want this to be one, which means we want the wilderness impact to be as close to zero as possible. Anything higher is not a good thing for catching unknown objects. We also use an absolute open set error, which is the count of unknown objects that get wrongly classified to the known class. We also use MAP to just get the goodness of detections by itself. And uh, I'm not going to walk into the results, obviously, since this was published, you know that uh, it, the numbers were probably reasonably good. And we compare with uh, faster RCNN uh, and also using some fine tuning strategies on top of faster RCNN. As I mentioned, this was perhaps the first work when we published it. So there were not too many baselines to compare it against. But here are some qualitative results, which perhaps are more interesting. So here is uh, an initial, after an initial task where we had the person category, you can see that the model detects the person category, but is also able to detect an unknown object and call it out as unknown. Okay, so calling it out as unknown becomes an important uh, uh, feature of the model. And later at time, when we get the label for the toothbrush class, the model now not only detects the toothbrush class effectively, but now because it's able to discern the known and the unknown better and, uh, and is able to separate this from the person class, we actually notice that it starts getting other classes better now. There's actually a book class uh, somewhere behind in the scene. It's actually able to detect that too uh, better as we get the unknown into your mainstream of known classes. Uh, does it always work? Obviously, we show some failure cases too. Uh, here is a person class and an unknown class, which is a suitcase. As we learn the suitcase class continually over time, it learns to detect something else at that point in time. It wrongly classifies it as a chair. So that is a failure case in our setting. But what is encouraging is that, yes, there was another class called window, uh, which it detected, which the, the proposal was correct, but the class label was incorrect. So that was something useful to take over, but there are some issues that can happen like this, which can be improved if we could 
uh, use the semantics of the label space a little bit better. Right, if you're more interested, this entire work is available on archive and in code. Uh, in fact, the code uh, is pretty well uh, used around the world. So it has over 980 stars and about 150 folks. So if you're interested in this work, you're welcome to probably fork uh, this code and use it for, for other applications. Right. Uh, for, uh, so now coming to some of the, where, where do you want to use this, right? Are we just manufacturing one more setting by combining a few things that already exist uh, is a question. So we did apply this in a couple of different settings that I want to talk about. So one of the applications we used it in is in autonomous navigation. So this work was published. Uh, the work is called New Objects on the Road. We learned them too. It was published at IROS of 2022, where we showed that if you now take uh, an autonomous navigation model that was trained on a cityscapes data set that's from a German background. And if you now apply this model to the Indian driving data set, there are newer kinds of vehicles like what are called as the auto rickshaws or the tuk-tuks in India. So you need to adapt this model. So when you run this model in a completely different context, you automatically want to be able to call out the unknown objects, detect them. And if you can get labels for them, improve your model continually and be able to detect uh, an object as a tuk-tuk or an auto rickshaw and still be able to call out something else which was unknown. In India's, we have a version of trucks called lorries which look a little bit different. So you could say that somebody could not label it and you should retain them as unknown over time. Okay, And that's what we could show in this particular work. We changed the detection loss a little bit here using a focal uh, kind of a loss. But that's what we say is useful here in autonomous navigation. One other very interesting application, which we're currently working on, we are hoping to actually deploy this, is in partnership with an organization called Embari. Embari stands for Monterey Bay Area Research Institute. Uh, so we are working with them on this. So Embari is an organization that uh, deploys underwater rovers, right? So they in fact had a challenge based on their data set at CVPR of this year. Their data set is called fathomnet.org. But when we started working with them, they didn't have this data set. Uh, so this data set comes from their underwater rover that goes around on the bottom of the uh, seabed, not just bottom, it goes at different levels of the seabed. And the seabed is a place where chat GPT may not really work, right? So you get some newer organisms each day and it's, uh, according to them, it's one of the, uh, still continues to be an unexplored frontier. There are certain organisms and their behavior that we know, but then as the rover goes through uh, the seabed, there are always newer organisms that you encounter and also newer behavior of some organisms that you've already seen. So they all, this particular organization already actually runs an object detector on their, on their uh, underwater rover. And the main goal that uh, they have, which we are working with them on, is if a newer organism shows up on their underwater rover, how do you call it out as unknown? and then stream up that particular image to a marine biologist on the surface, get the label for it and update the object detection model on the underwater rover and be able to update it and recognize that class over time without forgetting the past and still be able to call out some unknown objects for which you may have no labels at a given point in time. Right, A very tangible use case of open world object detection. We are currently working with them on deploying our algorithm on their underwater rover. And uh, the hope is someday maybe we'll be able to discover some species through this kind of uh, work where uh, we can call out or tag out an unknown object in as we learn continually. And we should be able to see whether that species was something that was known ever or it's something that's new altogether. Okay, so uh, just a check of time. Am I correct that maybe I have... Uh, five more minutes or so and yeah okay. yeah five to ten more minutes but okay, including one. questions so yeah you have some time okay great okay so i'll try to wrap up in the next uh, five to seven more minutes and hopefully there'll be time for questions so follow-up work that we had was novel class discovery without forgetting which is was in uh, eccv of 2022 so uh, this is joint work with uh, uh, joseph a student of mine and a bunch of others at google research so let me explain this setting by asking this question to you. Let me say, I show you these images here and I ask you, can you recognize these birds, right? So to be honest, I'm not a bird watcher. So I really don't know the difference between these birds or I don't know which birds these are. Maybe some of you would know the names of these birds. 
But most of us perhaps would not know the names of these birds. But if I now followed up and asked you, uh, can you tell me how many kinds of birds are there in these images? Right. So then you would perhaps say there are two kinds of images. The first, third and fifth perhaps are the same bird. The second and the fourth images perhaps correspond to the same bird. Right. So even though you perhaps don't know which class this belongs to, you are able to say how many kinds of birds there are in this particular group of birds. Right. So this is what we refer to as novel class discovery. But in this particular work, what we were trying to do is to, in a sense, go one step beyond what we were doing in the previous work. And I'll explain that in a moment. But the overall focus of novel class discovery, without forgetting, just to explain the setting, is you have a base learning phase, which is like your task zero of continual learning, where you train a model. And then at test time, you may encounter some unknown classes. You want to be able to discover those classes. And you also want to group them to see how many kinds of unknowns there are, right? In the open world object detector, we could call out an unknown, but we really didn't go into saying how many kinds of unknowns there are in that set of images that comes in. Here, we try to address that part of the problem as to not only do we want to call out an unknown, but we also want to say how many kinds of unknowns there are in this particular setting, right? But in all of this, you also don't want to forget uh, known classes that may uh, that may come up at test time too, right? So that's where the novel class discovery without forgetting comes into play here. So we show that this kind of a setting, it's different from semi-supervised learning, zero-shot learning, few-shot learning, clustering, and incremental learning. Each of this is perhaps different. So novel class discovery without forgetting allows you to contain this joint set of classes it doesn't require any side information, which is required in zero-shot learning. It can make use of a model bootstrapped with label data. So you don't need to, uh, you can use any base trained model for uh, our method here. And it can also be fully unlabeled in this particular setting, right? So our model can also work with fully unlabeled data in this particular setting. So this is what we deal with uh, here. And as I said, our uh, the reason this was an extension of our open world object detector was we were trying to see uh, if we were calling out an object as unknown, can we go beyond and say how many kinds of unknowns are there in your environment and try to incorporate that in your model itself. So here is the overall framework that we came up with. So we use uh, any standard uh, architecture. You have unlabeled data. So remember that you your feature extractor comes from a base trained supervised model. You could call that to be your task zero of your uh, continual learning setting. So you have a feature extractor and you have a bunch of layers after that potentially. And then we divide your head into a labeled head and an unlabeled head. Okay, that's our overall architecture. So once again, we have three components here that we introduce. The first component is a frozen feature extractor that was trained on labeled data. So we do a feature distillation where we ensure that our newer feature extractor maintains the feature from the feature extractor that was trained on your original labeled data. So you already have a model. You just ensure that you don't go too far away from that model in terms of the features. That's your feature distillation step. A second step, I'll just come to that uh, maybe uh, before I go to this step of pseudo latency, let me actually explain the third step here is uh, the main idea that we use to be able to separate out the unknowns in your, uh, in your data is using your labeled data, right? Let me explain that uh, using an example. Suppose your base classes had a, had a motorbike and a car and a bunch of other things, right? Now, if you have a bunch of unlabeled classes that come in, all of which seem like unknowns to you, if you give it to a supervised model, if you had a bicycle that comes in as one of the unknowns, it's more likely going to get classified as a motorcycle among your unknown classes than a car. Right? or than an animal for that matter, right? So every unknown class, it's probably going to get classified. If you forced the model to classify it as one of the known classes, it's perhaps going to get classified as one of the known classes that's closest to your unknown class. We decided that this is something that you could use to be able to cluster your unknown classes, depending on which known class it gets assigned to, if you let the labeled model uh, if you let the labeled head deal with that unknown class. This is what we mainly use. 
So we have a mutual information loss that we leverage between your known head and your unknown head. Your unknown head actually contains uh, your known classes as well as a bunch of unknown classes. We just pre-initialize a bunch of unknown classes here. We use a mutual information to convey the information from your known class head to your unknown class head to be able to cluster your unknown classes into several semantic labels. Okay, that's the core idea. Maybe I'll be happy to discuss more details if it becomes, uh, if it's of use later. And we also have a bunch of pseudo latents for which we use a backprop to image kind of a strategy where we use, uh, uh, when we have our base classes, we backpropagate a few of those uh, across your model to uh, store a bunch of pseudo latents and replay those pseudo latents periodically uh, uh, at test time to be able to distinguish between your known classes and your uh, unknown classes that may come at test time. Okay, those are the three strategies that we use here to be able to perform novel class discovery without forgetting. And we show that by doing this, we actually outperform uh, existing methods that were doing novel class discovery, but not necessarily considering forgetting. This was the first work that was doing novel class discovery without forgetting at that point in time, right? So if you're interested further, uh, the work is available online and you can go through it for uh, more details. I'll just talk about one more thing in a quick couple of minutes before I stop and uh, take questions is we were also looking at uh, what would happen if in the real world you were doing continual learning, but then your tasks were also zero shot, right? So that's the setting that we were trying to look at. So uh, let me, in the interest of time, avoid going over these details here, but uh, let me try to explain what uh, broadly we were trying to do. And I'll let you look at the paper if required uh, for more details. This work was published at CVPR of 2020, 2022. But just to explain the setting, imagine now that in a standard zero shot learning model, you would have tiger and horse as your labeled data. Let's say for a class like zebra, you only had attributes, but you had no uh, image information. We know that a standard zero shot learning model works for those kind of settings and is able to solve them. Right? So let's say at time two, you now have a newer set of classes because we are doing continually uh, zero shot learning. You now have a newer set of classes where some of them once again are zero shot, which means you have no, no images, but there are some other classes for which you have images and attributes. A zero shot learning model will perhaps start failing at this stage. And if you now go to a third task where you have a bunch of zero shot, zero shot classes, uh, a, a vanilla zero shot learning model would more or less not work unless you do something explicitly different. But what we try to do with our work is in each of these cases, you have a model that continues to work even if some of your classes just have attributes and no images at all. Uh, but the important thing that we also talk about here is that even a simple amalgamation of continual and zero shot can lead to so many different kinds of settings, right? You could have a setting where, uh, I don't think I have an image for that here, but we have it in our paper, uh, where, we sh where we show that even just combining a setting like continual and zero shot could lead to different settings, which we call static, dynamic, and online, where it's possible that you always assume that every new task will always be zero shot. Or you could assume a dynamic scenario where a class which did not have images in task zero could now have images in task one, right? What was a zero shot in an earlier task may now be a scene class in a, in a later task. So you have to address that also. Or we also consider an online setting where uh, you have a combination of both of these settings that I talked about, right? So I won't go into more details at this point, but you can look at the paper. We have a graphic that explains these three variants in more detail. And then we go through a feature generative approach based on GANs. Uh, we have a bunch of different losses, but broadly a feature generative approach that tries to learn continually by using generative replay, but also uses attributes the way we use it in zero shot to be able to beat uh, the core idea here is to come to a representation space which uh, where you have an attribute conditioned fee, uh, visual representation generation module and uh, a generation module that can also generate directly from your images 
we try to bring them and align them into a same space over time. So that's the way we combine a zero shot and a standard setting. But we also do generative replay to bring in continual learning here and learn over time, right? So I leave that at the slightly high level, but that's what we try to do in this particular work. And we show that uh, 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 when, when we do this, we are actually able to learn continually and also handle zero shot classes over time reasonably well when you compare to any uh, baseline or crude baselines, crude baselines or earlier adaptations of earlier methods, right? This work also is available online and the code is also available if required. I think I'll stop here with just some pointers to some open challenges, which also are some of our ongoing work here, is um, when you try to come out of these kind of siloed settings, right? So as you can uh, imagine from some of the works that I spoke about, when you try to go beyond just continual learning and try to break out of these silos and bring these settings together, a very important question becomes is what benchmarks are then relevant for, for such organic settings, right? So how do you create such benchmark, benchmarks? Obviously for this, uh, the problems that we worked on, we took existing data sets and I would like to say manufactured these settings, but it'll be wonderful to actually have established benchmarks that we can study for such organic settings. How do you create them, especially in the age of foundation models becomes an open problem what could be appropriate performance metrics that apply across the board, right? So in continual learning, we have forgetting measures. In zero-shot learning, we have, say, a harmonic mean. Uh, how do you bring these together in a, in a manner that makes sense across the board also becomes an important question to ask. Also, is there only one performance metric? Whenever we have multiple performance metrics, for example, continual learning itself, we use forgetting measures as well as an harmonic accuracy of the current task and the previous tasks, should we rather consider Pareto optimal fronts across multiple metrics rather than just use one metric becomes an important question. A more general question to also ask is, do we always need general purpose systems, right? So when do we need narrow AI and when do we need general purpose AI is a more fundamental question that all of these also brings up, I think. And finally, also studying all of this in a privacy preserving and federated manner becomes extremely important because when we learn from multiple domains, when we learn across tasks, uh, there could be issues related to privacy that we need to consider when we study these across tasks, maybe data from one uh, domain, even if you store it in a buffer, cannot be replayed because of privacy issues. Those are also issues to consider when we uh, bring these settings together to be more organic in uh, in how we deal with lifelong learning. I'll stop here uh, with an acknowledgement to all uh, students and collaborators. Uh, none of all of this work would be possible without them, as well as all the funding sources that have kindly supported us. I'll be happy to take questions uh, at this point. Apologies if I short over time, but happy to stay behind for questions. Great, thank you so much, Vineeth, for this really interesting talk. Um, there aren't any currently questions in the Q&A box, but I have a couple myself, so I can get us started. Um, sure. So I guess my my first question is with respect to the OR work from CBPR 21. Um, so I, I'm i pretty familiar with this work, and I never really uh, found this, or I never noticed in the plots that you were able to identify more boxes of objects when actually identifying the unknowns. And this is really interesting. I was wondering if you know which component of your model is actually helping it to be able to identify more boxes uh, when doing the unknown uh, discovery. Sure. Uh, I don't think it's an explicit component that's leading to that, but I think the just the overall idea of being able to separate unknowns. I think uh, if I'm right, uh, in, in the paper, we also have a separate table for... Uh, just showing that our incremental uh, object detection performance improves using the open world object detector. That's one of our tables in our ablation studies, if I'm right. So what we end up saying is that just by being able to separate the unknowns, you're able to detect better, right? So it's as simple as that. Just by removing ambiguity, you're able to detect known objects better. That's the broad idea here. So I don't think at least we spent, uh, we tried to attribute it to one particular component. I'm not sure if we removed some of these modules and studied that. I, I don't think it's explicitly that way, but uh, the broader idea was just being able to detect unknowns helps you detect knowns better. 
it's just a broader uh, idea from that perspective. Yeah, this is super interesting. Thank you. Um, sure, yeah. If there aren't other questions in the q and I can ask another one. So I think this application of the ore model to the underwater scenes is pretty interesting. And I was wondering what like the biggest challenges you're finding are with respect to porting that model from you know real world RGB data over to these underwater type scenes. Got it. Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, I mean, one of the reasons it's still not ported and it was not just a direct, direct translation of our code was uh, an underwater rover, unfortunately, uh, doesn't work on two-stage networks and unfortunately cannot even accommodate transformers. So currently what they run is versions of YOLO. So uh, we're trying to see how do you kind of port this idea into a YOLO kind of a framework. That seems to be one of the biggest bottleneck at this point because the kind of hardware they have on underwater rovers is uh, very, very limited. To, so we are unable to be able to use two-stage networks or transformer models on their kind of data. So that's one fundamental challenge that we have in porting this. But beyond that, there are a, a, a lot of interesting uh, challenges in that kind of a setting, uh, primarily because uh, marine biology in particular, or probably biology in general, I think has a lot of connections between organisms also. You have this entire organization of genus, species, and things like that. So we realize that uh, there are also connections in the label space that you have to address while that you can not just address, you can even leverage to improve the performance of your unknown detector or being able to uh, retrain your model uh, when you are able to label the nodes. So that's the other direction that we are exploring with them to be able to see if we could leverage the semantics between labels because you have a very, very well-structured semantics there. We're also looking at that to be able to bring that into our approach and hopefully uh, that will improve the performance of the model. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Thank you. Thank you a lot for sharing that. So you, yeah. we do have one question in the Q&A box and so I can read it. And then I think uh, for the sake of time, we'll probably end the session. But Nuri asks, do you think the newly discovered classes is related to the fact that the model is continuously being trained and it is not related to the labeling of the unknown objects at all? Uh, okay, I'm not sure I got the question, but let me explain the setting again. Uh, so when a model is trained on task zero and you deploy the model, the goal is to, uh, the objective or what we are trying to do is to detect unknown objects with respect to the classes in task zero. Once you detect the unknowns, you pass it to a human oracle. Uh, and if they know the labels, they label some of them. And you now add, you now train the model in a continual fashion. Now those labeled unknowns become known classes, which means at the end of say task one, you have a bunch of known classes okay and what is unknown could continue to remain unknown in task two right so i hope i made that clarification as to uh it's not that you're able to you're not constantly retraining at a given point in time you want to detect unknowns that are beyond the knowns in all tasks seen so far right so if you are at task four you could always have newer unknowns that you may encounter beyond all the labels that you've seen so far. Right? It is in that context that we are detecting unknowns. Uh, did I answer that question? Or was that still unclear? It's in the chat box. So if Nuri, if that okay, answers your me... question, let us know. Um, but I, th I think this made sense. Okay, okay. I thought I answered the question, but yeah, there's a follow-up question. Happy to take it. Yeah, it looks like it looks like the question right. was addressed. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Vineeth. I think this was a really interesting talk and it was really nice to see this underwater application as well. I think that's pretty interesting to see these types of things being applied in these real systems that have different challenges. Um, yeah, we are excited about that too. Yeah, we're waiting for the day when they find a species with that. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That's super cool. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Thank you so much again for being here with us. We really appreciated having you and this talk was super great. So thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Yeah, thank you uh, to all the organizers for having me here. Thank you.